Our Bible reading tonight is Esther chapter 1. Esther chapter 1. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials, the military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes, and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. Verse 5. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other, and the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Bistha, Habana, Bigtha, Abgatha, Zetha, and Carcass, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times and were closest to the king. Karshana, Shetha, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, Masena, and Memyukan, the seven nobles of Persia and Media, who had special access to the king and were highest in the kingdom. According to the law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? he asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then Memukan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median woman of nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct, will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice. So the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. This is God's word. Uh, 
Okay, well, we'll begin our new series. We finished 1 Corinthians, which was a long series, but I hope it was a blessing to everyone. Uh, would you uh, all just join with me in asking the Lord uh, for his blessing upon this time? Let's, let's ask him together. Our Father, we come to you through our Lord Jesus Christ and we confess that apart from him, uh, we have nothing with you. Apart from what he has done, we have no place with you, no position before you, apart from guilty. But Father, we thank you for all that we have been able to celebrate tonight, from the singing of praises to the Lord's Supper celebration and to the fellowship prayers and the reading of your word. We thank you for all of this, Lord. And now as we come to hear your word, uh, to hear it taught and, and to listen to you speaking, we just pray that you would focus our hearts and focus our minds. Uh, we are so quick to forget that the devil is at work and he is on the prowl and he hates when your powerful word goes forth. So, Lord, we pray that you would restrain him and that you would guard our hearts. And Lord, we pray that we would truly hear from you. And Lord, we pray for the series that it would be a blessing uh, to each of us, to this congregation. And Lord, we pray that we would see more and more of Christ, that he'd be pleased with all that is done here. So send forth your Holy Spirit, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the new series, uh, uh, Book of Esther, I was told that uh, Gems has been for a little while going through uh, the Book of Esther. So uh, for the young girls in the baby's room, those who are here, uh, it's good that we can do this together. Uh, but as I was thinking about this, especially the first uh, sermon in the Book of Esther, being the church in the 21st century now, it's natural for us to feel or to ask what possible relevance could this ancient book of this little narrative, what relevance could it have in our lives and, and for us? And as you think about that, because we're so far removed from it, it puts preachers, teachers, and whoever reads the book of Esther into a dangerous position in handling it. Now, teaching the book of Esther can be hazardous, because as you read through it, I'm sure most here would be familiar with the story. It's almost a kind of Cinderella story as you look at it unfold. And unfortunately, there have been many, many occasions where this book has been taught to promote feminism or to promote women empowerment or how to defy the patriarchy, as it were, how to be brave like Esther, how to be a hero like Esther and to challenge the system. Now, to take this book like that would be to completely miss the point of why the book of Esther is in the Bible. And, and, and to look at it like this would be uh, completely to miss how the book fits in with the Bible's unfolding story, because it comes at a specific place in the Bible's unfolding story. And it is to completely miss what God is actually doing. So we need to be careful of that. Is Esther herself, is she a key figure in the book? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is the book all about her? No, it's not. Now, you may know that the book of Esther and the book of Song of Songs are the only two books in the Bible that do not mention the name of God once in it. Not one occurrence of God's name and yet we'll see tonight, and especially in the coming weeks, uh, that the book is all about God and His work in this world. Now, just a quick comment here uh, at the beginning of the, of the genre of the book of Esther. Now, this, this book here has some of the best storytelling elements that would rival any story that's ever been told uh, on earth. One writer captures it like this. Let me quote him. He says, the book of Esther is a story par excellence. It has virtually all the ingredients that people through the ages have loved in a story. A beautiful and courageous heroine, a romantic love thread, a dire threat to the good characters, a thoroughly evil villain, suspense, dramatic irony, evocative descriptions of exotic places, 
sudden reversal of action, poetic justice, and a happy ending. End quote. Now, that is all very true. But what is problematic when you think about the book of Esther like that is it's almost, we almost get tempted to interpret it like fiction. It's almost Disney-like. The story is that fantastic. And yet, note how the Holy Spirit intentionally opens the book. I mean, the Spirit uses His words very, very carefully. Look at the first line there. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. Now, that, that line is really, really important. That phrase is used exactly in other books of the Bible and in specific books, in the book of Joshua, in the book of Judges, and in the book of Samuel. And what do all those books have in common? They are historical narrative. That phrase, it happened during the time of. He is grounding this book in history. These are true events to affirm that, yes, there's an engrossing story that we're going to embark on, but this is nonfiction. We are not considering a parable in the coming months. This actually happened. And so tonight, just in chapter 1, we are going to just break down the events as they unfold in chapter 1, but then we're going to close with God's purpose and what He's doing and what we can glean from it. So that's how we're going to look at this uh, tonight. Now, the title of the sermon uh, is... Uh, the mouse that roared at the lion. So firstly, I want us to consider our first point tonight is the lion. Look at verses 1 to 2. Hopefully you have your Bibles open. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. So we're immediately introduced to the Persian emperor, King Xerxes. Now, your translation might have King Ahasuerus, and that's just the Hebrew form. It is King Xerxes, as he's better known. Now, just a little bit about Xerxes. He re reigned over the Persian Empire from 486 to 465 BC. Now, when Xerxes ascended the throne, he was in his 30s. Esther ends up becoming the queen in 480 BC. Now, just a little bit of context here, how the Jews ended up being part of Xerxes' world and empire, as it were. So I've just got a slide Yeah, Russ, if you can pull it up. Just a, just a timeline here, just for it's a bit, so it's a bit helpful. Should be able to just see it. Now, if you look there, 720 BC, just going back, this is how they get to Xerxes. The Jews are exiled by the Assyrians in 720 BC. Now, eventually, Assyria... The Assyrian Empire falls to Babylon, which is about 100 years later. Now, in 586, the Babylonians come and attack Israel, and the temple is destroyed, brought to the ground, and the, and the Jews are exiled again. Now, eventually, time unfolds, and Babylon, that great kingdom, falls to the Persians. The Persian Emperor Cyrus takes control. Now, it, God... In the book of Isaiah, a major theme is God moves the heart of Cyrus and puts the desire in Cyrus' heart to let the Jews go back home to their land. And not only to go back home, but he even funds their rebuilding of the temple. It's amazing. Sovereignty of God. Now, eventually, Cyrus is succeeded by Darius. Darius plans to invade Greece, but he cannot achieve it. Loses the war. Now... Darius allows the Jews to go home, as I said, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Cyrus allowed the Jews to go home. Now, when Darius is on the throne, many of the Jews, they choose not to go back home to their land, and they choose not to participate in the rebuilding of the temple, and they actually choose to stay in, in, in the Persian Empire up north because they're comfortable, they have assimilated, they've started life there. And they're, and they're quite comfortable. Now, eventually, Darius is succeeded by Xerxes. And so, under Xerxes, you have Jews living in his provinces. So, look what Xerxes inherited. It says here in, in verse 1 that he ruled over 127 provinces. If we can just go, Russ, to the next slide, just to have a look at how big 
the Persian Empire was. He ruled over 127 provinces. This is a huge amount of territory. So from the left of the screen there, you can see from the edge of Greece down to the tops of northern Africa, through the Middle East, across to India. This is a massive empire. Huge. And and this, imagine establishing rulers in all of those provinces with all different languages. What a feat. And it says there in verse 2 that he reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. You can just see Susa just to the upper right of Babylonia there. So that, this, that little spot there, that's where Xerxes is, and this is where our event takes place tonight, in that little spot there. Now, Susa was one of the places where the prophet Daniel had one of his visions, and when Xerxes was succeeded by his son Artaxerxes, the prophet Nehemiah ended up being Artaxerxes' cupbearer in this location. So the Bible is knitting it together. Thanks, Russ. You can uh, close it up for us. Now we get a bit of insight into Xerxes' character. Let's, let's look at what kind of man he was. Look at verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. So he throws this banquet, this this party, as it were, for all the military leaders, rulers, and nobles over those 127 provinces. So they're all summoned. They travel many miles to get to Susa to this banquet. And it's such a big feast, only three years into his reign. He's only been king for three years. But what kind of feast is it? Something that none of us have ever seen before. What does it say in verse 4? For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. A six-month tour of his kingdom, hosting all of these guests, feeding them and caring for them, providing and entertaining them. Six-month party, as it were. And if that wasn't enough, look at verse 5. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. So the six-month feast, as it were, and tour is followed up by a week-long banquet for all those living in Susa, from the least to the greatest, from rich to the poor. Now, the second banquet, it says, happens in his palace garden, Now, there is no more prestigious venue that could be hired for this party. Look look at his pad. Look at the menu, right? Look look at verses 6 to 8. It's it's amazing. Look at the detail. The garden had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and, and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on mosaic pavement of porphyry marble, mother of pearl and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one differing from each other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, for the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. I mean, how about those details? What a description, right? You have costly decorations, the most costly garments. You have gold and silver couches. You have gold cups to drink from of every kind of size imaginable. You have the pavements of marble and rare stones. And you have wine on tap that is without limit on your demand for a full week. This is huge. Now, interestingly, in 1884, French archaeologists unearthed the palace in Susa. And if you go to the Louvre in Paris today, you can see the treasures of this palace. They still stand today. But now we have, to, we have to ask the question, why does the biblical author, we read through this on purpose, why does the biblical author go to such great pains to give all of these fine details? I mean, look at that description. He doesn't need to do it. Why is, why is it recorded like this? The extent of his kingdom, 127 provinces. The length of the feast, how many days? All the things in his palace. I mean, all of those details. Why does he do it? The intention is for the reader to be absolutely wowed. You would, you would read this and be amazed at the wealth and the power of Xerxes, the resources that belong to this man. I mean, it's when you see, right, those shows and 
all those reports, those videos of the homes of celebrities and sports athletes, right? You, you see the footage in their home and they've got the indoor tennis courts and the spas and the fountains and the gallery of cars, this extravagance. And you're supposed to be left thinking, oh my goodness, was that even possible? That's what the author's trying to do here and show us. But history tells us a few years later that Xerxes didn't just throw this elaborate banquets. He didn't throw them just because he had this huge ego. There was more at play. He had, he had motivations behind this. In a few years' time, he would plan to reinvade Greece, and he would seek to accomplish something that his father failed to do. His father couldn't conquer Athens, and he would now try and invade there. But how would he do it? He had to get all of the rulers, all of the nobles from all the 127 provinces in his empire. He needed to bring them in and secure their loyalty. He needed them on his side. He needed to wow them. He needed to impress them. He needed to show them that he had the greatest empire on the planet. That's why this banquet is happening. There are motivations happening behind this. And yet, again, history shows us in a few years when he leads all of them to attack Greece, he fails. And he has to come back home in defeat. And not only does he lose the war, he loses his great wealth. It's interesting that by the time the book of Esther was written, many years later after this, the biblical author knew what, was, what would happen to King Xerxes? He knew that he was going to come back with his tail between his legs and lose everything. But he could have introduced Xerxes as the king who lost it all or who would soon lose it all. He could have written it like that. But the Holy Spirit tells him, the writer, to pen just the opposite. No, no, no. Portray him in all of his extravagance. Portray him in all of his splendor, with all of his possessions. Portray him at the peak of his reign in all of his glory and splendor. Why? What does Proverbs teach us? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. He shows Xerxes in all of his splendor to show how far he fell from greatness. And, and see, there will be a massive reversal here. He will go from rich to poor, from having everything to nothing, from glory to shame. And this is important because the whole book of Esther, the key theme of Esther is great reversals. Great reversals. And this just keeps on coming up. Haman, he makes it to the top as absolutely powerful. And then he falls and comes to ruin. Mordecai is in dust and ashes and he's promoted to the highest place in the kingdom. Esther, she's a Jewish nobody. She becomes the queen of the Persian Empire. And the Jews are on the brink of extinction. And they are mourning in fear. And they end up triumphing, celebrating, and ruling over their enemies. But here, the author wants us to see we have a mighty king at the peak of his reign, powerful, wealthy, planning and scheming, parting and feasting. But the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So we've seen the lion. Secondly, let's consider the mouse that roared. Verse 9. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Now, we're introduced to the second key character here, Queen Vashti. Now, she throws a banquet as well, but this is for all the women who serve in the king's palace. She wants to put something special on for the women who serve in the king's courts. Now, the scenario that's set up here, don't miss it. There are two week-long banquets running simultaneously. You have one banquet going on in the king's garden, where the king is at, and you have one banquet going on inside the palace. The king's at one of the banquets, the queen's at the other banquet. Two parties going on, but it's one celebration happening. That's the scene here. And this leads us to the shock in the story. But don't miss how the author preps the reader for the shock. Look how he starts verse 10. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine. Now, whatever the king is about to do, this comes under the influence of a week's long intake of alcohol. Whatever decision comes now, 
comes from a very, very drunk king. Okay, the author's getting you ready for that. Look at verse 10 to 11. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was high in spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Bistha, Habona, Bigtha, Abagtha, Zetha, and Karkas, to bring before him Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. So here we have another little insight into who Xerxes was. He could, as the greatest king and emperor of his time, he could have any woman that he wanted, any. And you can be absolutely certain of it, that the queen that he chose would be the most physically attractive and stunning woman that could be found. That's who he would have chosen. And the biblical author comments on it, right? She was lovely to look at. That's what he chose And so at the finale of the week-long banquet, the king calls for the queen to come in, and he summons her. But he calls her not for a cuddle, not for embrace, not for a kiss, not to keep him company. He calls her to get her on the stage, for her to do a bit of a twirl in her crown for all the drunken men, for her to do a little bit of a show, a bit of eye candy for the men, like a piece of meat to showcase her as his trophy wife. You see, she is placed wherever he wants. That is his desire. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 18, 22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Wives are a gift from God, but to Xerxes, she's nothing more than another one of his possessions. Just like the golden cups, just like the golden lounges, just like the decorations. She's another one of his possessions, just like the rest of the furniture to be put wherever he wants it. How different and how wonderful God's calling for husbands in Ephesians chapter 5. How how different. Could, Could you get night and day, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid down his life for her. Husbands, wash her in the word. Nourish her as you would your own body. How sweet and how beautiful to taste the fruit that comes from the gospel. And friends, how bitter and foul the fruit that comes from the wisdom of the world. It's on showcase before us. But friends, how difficult it is to fight the sinful nature, right? Now, we can shake our head at Xerxes at the way he's behaving and the way that he treats his wife, but it's not much different to what we see in much of our day today, is it? You have guys who have girlfriends or wives, and they are happy for them to walk around in a bikini, to wear skin-tight clothing, revealing their body, revealing all of their skin, drawing in the attention of all the other eyes of the men in the vicinity. And there's almost a sense of pride in that man or that husband that people are looking what he, at what he's obtained, that she's mine, and they're impressed. Young men, if you have a girlfriend, she's not for show. She's not for show. And husbands, if you have a wife, she is not a trophy to be displayed around. She's a beautiful gift from the Lord a beautiful gift from the Lord, and she is for you and you alone. Now Xerxes wants all eyes on his attractive queen, and he commands her presence. He commands it. And you notice he sends seven officials to bring her out. Why send so many servants to bring out one one lady? Well, he wants this to be a big event, right? It's almost like rolling out the red carpet. This is going to be the climax of the party. Imagine seven servants coming out and then out emerges the queen in front of everyone. But this all leads to the sharp turn in the story. Look at verse 12. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Now the seven officials, they returned to the king, but they returned without the queen. They only come back bringing one thing and they come back with a message. What's the message? No. 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 I'm not coming. Now, I want you to try and picture, picture this in light of the setting. 
Think of what's going on here. Just months earlier, this king summoned all of his servants to go out into all the regions of the Persian Empire to summon all of the rulers and bring them. All these people had to come from miles and miles. He commanded it, and it happened. He commanded that there would be endless wine at his banquet, and it was done. He commanded that everything at the party be shown for 180 days, all of his wealth, all of his splendor, and it was done. He calls for his wife to come, and she says no. In front of everyone, the king's never deprived of his wishes, never. And here at the pinnacle of his banquet, he is denied, and that by a woman. Friends, this is the mouse roaring at the lion. In front of everyone. Understand this. She's not just saying no to her husband. She's saying no to the king. That is huge. And Xerxes is embarrassed. He's humiliated before all of his guests. Can you imagine the silent hush and the awkwardness after everyone was anticipating her to come? And the mightiest king is defied by his queen. How can he lead 127 rulers into battle, 127 provinces into battle, if he cannot even lead his wife into the party. So we've seen the lion, we've seen the mouse that roared, now we consider the lion's teeth. How do you think Queen Vashti's message was received? Well, look at verse 12. When the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Friends, the most terrifying thing in this world is the anger, wrath, and punishment of God. There is nothing scarier than the anger of God. But the second most scariest thing and terrifying thing on this planet is the anger and fury of a king. Listen to the scriptures. Proverbs 20, verse 2. The king's terror is like a roaring lion. Whoever provokes him to anger forfeits their life. Proverbs 16, 14, the king's wrath is a messenger of death. We know that Xerxes was a brutal, ruthless king. On one occasion, we have a historical record. He summoned some men to build a bridge for him. Now, bad weather delayed the building project, so he got all those builders in and he beheaded all of them because bad weather delayed his project. But it's a miracle. He doesn't kill her. He doesn't kill Queen Vashti. Instead... He seeks the counsel of some advisors and what he should do. Now, the reason he does this, remember, he's got motivations here. He's got ambition. He's got a plan of attacking Athens. So just killing her might not be the best solution. So he seeks counsel. What's going to best help my cause, my political agenda? Well, he seeks the counsel of seven wise men. What do we know about these wise men? Well, verse 14 gives us a few details. These seven men were... Verse 14, they were the closest to the king. They were nobles who had special access to the king, so they could come to the king uninvited. No one else was allowed to do that, as we'll see with Esther later. And they were the highest in the kingdom. So so what do we know about these seven men that he seeks counsel from? They receive special privileges from the king. They have their royal positions because of the king. And they lived extremely privileged lives because of the king. So what kind of advice do you think these seven men are going to give the king? Do do you think they're going to tell him, you know what, you should really apologize to to Queen Vashti and you should reconcile with her because you you acted like a drunken fool? Or do you think these men are going to tell him exactly what is needed to pick up his ego that's been shattered? Well, in verses 16 onwards, we won't read all of it, But one of the advisors, Memucan, he speaks up and gives advice to the king. Now, he notes that what Queen Vashti has done, she's dishonored the king, but that's not all that she's done. She has sown dishonor into the whole Persian empire. King, this isn't just about you and the queen. There will now be dishonor throughout the whole kingdom because of her. There will be women everywhere who take a cue from Queen Vashti and say, hey, let's all rebel against our husbands. Let's all throw off the yoke of headship. And it's quite humorous because Memucan actually believes that the first women in the kingdom to defy their husbands will be the wives of the seven nobles. Look look at verse 18. 
It's supposed to be humorous for us. He says this, This very day the, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There'll be no end of disrespect and discord. Our homes, our wives aren't going to listen to us anymore. Here uh, he shows the, the, the irony of it and the humor of it. And so to ensure that Vashti's actions aren't praised, they urge the king to write a decree. King, you need to make a new law now. Inscribe a new law to stop this. Look at verses 21 to 22. Look at the new law that they make. The king and his nobles were pleased with the advice, so the king did it as Memucan had proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in his own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler of his own household. It's quite hilarious, isn't it? What's the law? Every husband, put it in writing, they need to be head of their home. Now, now here's, the, here's the humor of it all. What, what, ex, what Xerxes proclaims must happen in every home doesn't happen in his own palace. What Xerxes says must happen by every man in his own household, Xerxes was unable to do himself. And, and here's the humor of it. Again, pride going before a fall. And look, they actually think it's going to work. Look at verse 20. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the great, greatest. Now the Holy Spirit records these words for us here to show how laughably foolish the wisdom of the world is. How do they think they're going to get respect in the family home? By writing it into law. How do we get wives to submit, to respect their husbands? By brute force, put it in the law. Listen, if you have to write respect into the law, it's no longer respect, is it? It's compulsion. It's compulsion. Where does respect come from? Where, where does it come from? It's by recognizing God's created order. That God made Eve as Adam's helpmate, his faithful companion, and so suitable and wonderful, the companion, the two could actually become one flesh. But how is respect cultivated and grown? If that's just recognizing God's order, okay, this is how he's designed it. How is it cultivated and grown from wives and women? As, them, as the men and husbands grow in Christ's likeness as they start to look more and more like Christ, as they start to imitate more and more of Christ, the respect is cultivated. So here we see that the lion's teeth, he's roaring, he's barking, he's writing laws here. But beneath it all, you see a man without wisdom. You see a man without God. You see a man coming undone. Well, lastly tonight, let's see our final point. We see the God over mice and lions. Now, there's one verse in the text that pulls back the curtains. One verse here that sheds light to reveal what's really happening in the story. Those are the events. But what's really going on here? Why is all of this happening? Why all of this drama? Why? Look at verse 19. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, Media which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Why, why is all of this happening? So that Vashti is removed and another woman take the place of queen. That's why it's all happening. That's why all the drama is going on. That a new queen might enter the stage. A young Jewish girl who is a worshipper of Yahweh. God's unlikely chosen instrument to rescue God's people from extinction, to rescue Esther's generation of Jews. But see, if that's where you leave the story, that this all happened so that Esther's generation could be rescued from extermination, you miss the point of the book of Esther. You miss why it's in our Bible. It was absolutely vital that Esther ascends the throne so that her generation could be protected. Why? Because a thousand years earlier, 
God made a promise to Abraham. And he said to Abraham, Abraham, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Abraham gives birth to Isaac. Isaac gives birth to Jacob. Jacob gives birth to Israel as a nation. And God says, through Israel will come Messiah. Will come Messiah, come Savior. If a new queen doesn't come in, if this generation isn't saved, then Messiah won't come. And the Savior will not arrive. This is not just about protecting the Jews of Esther's generation. Friends, it's so much bigger than this. The whole plan of redemption rests upon this conversation between the king and his seven foolish advisors who are scared of their wives rising up against them. Do you see our God, what he is doing here? Friends, if God was not ruling over mice and lions, Christ wouldn't have come and died for sinners. You and I wouldn't be here this evening. You and I would still be in our sins. There'd be no gospel, there'd be no church, and there'd be no eternal life. And all of us would be awaiting the fearful, eternal judgment of God. Do you see what's going on here? Do you see how the book of Esther fits in the Bible's history of redemption? See, each chapter as we work through, God is bringing us one step closer to the great unveiling of the Son of God come in the flesh. It's all leading towards that because for God so loved the world that he would give his only Son. And John 3.16 would be fulfilled. It would be. It must be fulfilled. So let me close. What can, we, what can we learn from this passage? Those are the events. This is where the book of Esther is. What can we glean from this? I want you to just think, compare the God of the book of Exodus to the God of the book of Esther. What, what, what a difference that we see in the book of Esther, uh, in the book of Exodus. God is all supernatural signs and wonders. He is sending plagues. There is supernatural phenomena everywhere. There is lightning. There is terror. There is parting of seas. And what about the God in the book of Esther? He's nowhere to be seen. His name isn't even mentioned once. Not once in the whole book. See, in Exodus, God is on full display. In the book of Esther, God is completely invisible. And yet we see that God doesn't always use the incredible miracles. Rather, here in the book of Esther, we're going to see God uses people, unexpected people, ordinary situations, ensuring that the right people are in the right place and the right conversations are had at exactly the right time so that his purposes are fulfilled. A very different God in Esther to the book of Exodus. And this is so important for us. Friends, how often do we despise the hidden work of God in our lives? We get so disappointed and discouraged when we don't see the dramatic answers to prayer that we were looking for, the big sign, and we conclude that God's not working. But the book of Esther teaches us something different. We often think that God is absent, but he is working behind the scenes, making sure, ordering every minute detail of our lives. Romans 8.28 is a summary of the book of Esther. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Every detail of your life, Christian. And what else do we learn from this passage? What else can we glean from it if it's setting the stage for Christ? Well, you have to compare the two kings, don't you? King Xerxes with the greatest empire on the earth. You have the king of the greatest empire, but compare him to the ruler of the kings of the earth, Jesus Christ. And, and the Holy Spirit beckons us to look into him. Xerxes couldn't handle absolute power. He couldn't. It led to his undoing. It led to the breaking of his kingdom. It led to his ruin. He couldn't handle absolute power. No one, friends, no man can handle absolute power because of our sinful nature. Think about Solomon. He had it. And it led to his great downfall. Think about Israel's greatest king, David. 
All that power led to him using it to feed his lust and then to use all that power to cover it up with murder. Friends, there is only one who can handle absolute power. And that is the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And he can have absolute power and still be completely fair, completely just, completely righteous. And he can use absolute power to become the servant of all and lay his life down as a ransom for sinners. Look at King Xerxes. He chooses for his own joy to shame his wife in front of everyone. What do we see of Christ? It was his joy to take our shame upon himself and for him to be paraded and made a spectacle before sinners. She is invited to a banquet that is going to end sour. And friends, every single one of us has been beckoned by Christ to come to the great marriage banquet, eternal life, the new heavens and the new earth, where we will be with him forever. You may look at this story and think, Vashti was noble to refuse the king's demand, but you do not leave this place thinking it's noble to refuse the call of King Jesus. There is none like him. There is none like him. And so he reaches out to everyone and says, Believe in me for the forgiveness of sins. Believe in me for eternal life. And come and be my followers and my disciples of a kingdom that will not end. This is where the book of Esther is leading us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is wonderful and rich. And the oldest stories in this book are life-giving. And we thank you for that. We thank you that the book of Esther is not just an abstract, out-of-place story. But we thank you that even in that we see Christ. And we are drawn out to him the King that is altogether wonderful. Thank you that we have come, so many here in this room have come to know him and to love him and to receive the eternal life that he gives. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the kind of King that you are, all-powerful, the servant of all, though. We thank you that you came to serve us and lay your life down for us. We're eternally grateful, Lord. We will be. Lord, we pray for any who are here, who have refused Jesus' call and summons to repent and believe. I pray that there would be none who defy us, defy so great a king. Please work in every heart. And Lord, for us who know you, help us to trust, even when we don't see you on display, that you are at work. You are at work in our lives, bringing about the purposes that please you. And Lord, that's enough for us. That's enough for us. So, Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing.